Amen. We're going to move quickly tonight, so we're going to take the tithes and offerings. And uh, if you could give that to Sister Deb to pass around and you pass out the no. Yeah. Amen. The Bible says that we overcome by the Lamb and the word of our testimony. Amen. And you know how you can have a testimony? By living the word. Amen. You, you know that lots of people offer lip service to God, but the Bible says their hearts are far from Him. And the Bible calls that a whitewashed tomb. Anybody, anybody here want to be called a whitewashed tomb? I heard a preacher one time, he said it this way, you know what, you can paint a turd, but it's still a turd. And and that sounds really gross, and it drops. But you know what? That's what it's like when we try to serve God with our mouth, and our heart is really far from Him. Everybody else knows it stinks. Everybody else really knows what it is, even though it's painted up real pretty to look like something else. And the only person that's deceived usually is the one that painted it up. And guess what? A lot of people try to say, well, I didn't know no better. Well, guess what? You had to know something to paint it in the first place. You may have forgotten, you may have convinced yourself that you really was something else after you painted it for a while, and that's how you become deceived. But you weren't deceived in the beginning when you painted it. When you left the stinking around. You say, why are you talking about this with offering, Pastor? Well, I'm just giving a real quick thing because, listen, if you want to be blessed, follow the Word of God. Amen. Amen. Live it out. If you don't want to, quit painting your your quit painting whitewashing things. I, I won't say that again. It was a very vulgar thing, but it was. Uh, I pray it drove the, the point home in a way that you'll never forget. Because. You know what, if you're, if you're going through stuff, ask yourself, well, am I under an attack or am I just being a knucklehead? <coughs> am I really lined up with the Word of God or am I not? I don't know who all this is for tonight, but it's for somebody. And line your life up. <coughs> God's faithful to His Word. He's faithful to watch over it to perform it. <coughs> Amen? Amen? But you know, lots of people was looking for Jesus when He came. But very few recognized who He was. Today, lots of people are looking for a Savior, but very few want, want to fall, make Him Lord. It didn't just say those that can. It didn't say those that confess Jesus is Lord. It says those that confess that Jesus is Lord and Savior and make Him Lord of your life. That means you put Him in charge of every area. And if you don't, you just whitewash that area, and it looks good till somebody gets to know you. And then. Today's society, that's why we don't want nobody to really get to know us because sometimes we're afraid what they might just dig up and we might have to do it. <coughs> oh, I know I'm preaching real good and heavy already tonight. We haven't even got started. Because listen, God wants you blessed. Amen. That's the truth, amen? amen? But you're going to have to decide whether or not you're going to, you know, the Word of God will challenge you. It will change you. It will bless you. It will cause you to overcome. And you can try to you can fool yourself eventually, and you can try to think you're fooling everybody else. The only person you'll be fooling is you. And you'll have an effect. <coughs> the Bible says a little leaven leavens the whole thing. You know, there's people that won't come to this church or this church or that church or go to any church because they, they met a whitewashed something or another and thought that's how everybody was in that building. And they associated who Jesus was according to that person who claimed that they was a follower of Jesus. 
So let's be the, we're tonight we're going to talk about the church. So let's be the church. The church doesn't mean you're perfect. But if you whitewash something, you've never repented and turned from it. Now lots of people repent for things, but they never turn. I want to tell you that's not true repentance. Repentance is when you're truly sorrowful and you turn from that thing. When you turn, that means you don't keep going back and doing it. The Bible says, as a fool is to a folly, so is a dog that returns to his vomit. I didn't write it. Could you imagine a dog going lapping it up? That's what somebody's like when they keep whitewashing stuff. They're a dog that they're just a silly dog that keeps returning to their dog. They're vomit. They 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 do the same thing over and over again. And it keeps making a mess and they go back and keep eating. Sounds appetizing, doesn't it? Does that make you want to be part of that body? See, that's why the Lord, you know, and, and you'd think sometime they'd realize, hey, this I really don't want to eat this again. It wasn't good the first time. I know it's strong metaphors tonight, but it's the Word of God. There's a reason why it's in there. Yep. You say, well, we just took the tithes and offerings. Great. Let's have a blessed life, but let's let's not, you know, let's not deceive ourselves. Let's line up with the Word. <laughs> You say, well, I'm doing my best, Pastor. Well, great. Then this doesn't affect you. You just have to examine your heart and make sure you're okay. Then don't you? Mm -hmm. If you don't really want to do that, then you've already got a problem. Yeah. <coughs> Boy, this is a strong meat tonight, ain't it already? Aren't you so glad you came on this cold winter evening? Because we're going to talk about the church. And the church should be like the most appetizing meal in the world, appealing to people to come unto Christ. The church should be something that represents Jesus Christ himself. And you know what? I find it very difficult today to actually find a true embodiment of Christ with flesh on, even sometimes in my own self, even though I'm doing my very best to hit the mark. But I'm going to tell you, it's only whenever the church actually starts being what God ordained it to be that you'll start seeing people come in to want to join the body. Does anybody want to... Uh, Anybody here want to, want, to, want to be a part of a sick body? Like, got gangrene and stuff, and you're like, hey, I want to hook up with that body over there. Does that, does that really want to appeal to anybody? Do you know that's what it's like whenever the body of Christ is sick and not really taking care of itself? And people go, man, why well, don't I want to be part of that? I've got enough problems on my own. <laughs> not realizing that Jesus is the answer to those problems because they're not getting a true representation of who Jesus is. Right. Amen? Amen? Now, some of that may seem imp impossible. I'm going to give you a little small nugget. Uh, if I, I think everybody in this church actually can answer this now because I know I've taught on it pretty strong for years, but we'll see. What's grace? Empowers you. First answer right out of the bat. But what's the, what's the normal answer you hear from people when you talk about grace? Unmerited favor. Unmerited, which it is that. Mm -hmm. We can't never do nothing to deserve the love of God. But, and what else is it that people usually say? The crazy agape love, which it is that. But the one that everybody misses, which I knew you guys would get, because I've taught on it so heavily throughout the years, is grace empowers you to change. It's God's supernatural ability for you to be able to line up with the Word of God. God's In my weakness, the Bible says, God's grace is sufficient. It is made perfect in me. That means He empowers me to be like Him. And anything you say that the can'ts, I couldn'ts, I shouldn'ts, and I wouldn'ts is a whitewashed tomb, isn't it? Because you're saying God, God isn't powerful enough to cause you to become like Him. Right? Now, how many people want to be a part of that church? Or somebody that just says, well, I can do whatever I want to do, and God's grace is amazing. He just loves me. Or do you want a God that's big enough to change you? 
When you don't even when you realize listen, you know what it's God? When you when you know you can't do it inside yourself. And you say, God, I need you to help me here. And guess what? I promise you, each time you get to that place, He will empower you to overcome those things. Because the Bible says, 1 John 4, 4, greater is He that's within us than He that's within the world. And see, the, the thing is, the enemies attack that so much because it's one of the, the great, biggest empowerments the church has to face every obstacle of the enemy and to be the church. Otherwise, it's a sick whitewashed tomb or the other T word. Amen? Amen. <coughs> so, tonight we're going to talk about what it is. Now, there's a difference between what the church is as a body and how many know I've taught extensively out here, but just because that we are the church... The Bible tells us that we're not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together, and that is a large body of it. Everybody likes to see, you know, you know, I've never met one person that quoted that scripture world. God says whether he's in the midst of them or two or three, I just got to gather two or three. I've never seen one of those people actually really serving God that always is seen as an excuse. I've never seen anybody using that scripture that is actually wholeheartedly going after God with all their heart. And I'm not knocking house churches and all those things, but usually it's a bunch of people that's full of rebellion that want to do their own thing. So they get together a bunch of like-minded believers and talk about all the wounded places they came from instead of getting healed up. And I'm not saying every one of them, but I'm saying that the, the Bible tells us how a church, the church is supposed to act. It tells us how it's supposed to function. It tells us the leadership roles are supposed to be in it. It even tells us where to go. As the church. It doesn't... Now listen, when I say tell, you can say commands. He's not asking our opinion. If you would like it on the first day of the week, <laughs> go and gather at your convenience wherever you may like and come together and talk about me. That's not what it says, is it? I mean, he very blatantly says, Forsake not the assembling of yourselves together for edification of one another and edification of him so you can be about to work. He didn't say come together just so you all can feel good about all the troubles you're going through. I know I'm really strong teaching. I've got, got a lot of stuff to cover tonight. But, you know, the church is called to, you know... It, it's called to be the place where we all get ministered to so we can minister to others. It's the place we get discipled so we can minister. But the church is also Jesus with skin on in the everyday world. We're his hands and feet. If you don't like the presence that you're seeing, it's time that the church ups its, its presence in the world around. Well, let's get started. It's not a building nor an organization. The word church comes from the Greek word ecclesia, meaning an assembly of called out ones. That assembly of called out ones. That means, guess what? He there, he expects a difference. He doesn't look. He ain't looking for a whitewashed bunch. And, and so that is, they are called out of the world and separated unto God. That means you should be able to tell a difference when you come to a church. When you meet the church anywhere in the world, you should be able to tell a difference between that person and how the world's acting. You know, I'll just go ahead and name some stuff that nobody wants to talk about. Want to talk about divorce? It's just as high in the church as in the world because everybody says that's just okay. That's not what the Word of God says, number one, because most people aren't operating in love. They're not submitted. They're, they're not following any of the Word of God. And it started whitewashing way before it got to divorce. And they whitewashed their whole lives. And then so that when divorce came, that wasn't no big deal to go ahead and step over into that. How's that for straight preaching? And that's what happens when we start whitewashing things. It becomes a dangerous place, does it not? Because God's called, when people meet you, they should be able to say, "You, they are called out. They are separated unto me. In this sense, the Old Testament saints were referred to as the church in the wilderness. Oh, doesn't that sound like fun? 
But let me tell you, they were called out. They were separated for a purpose and they were refined in the wilderness. This is not our home, but this is a place we're called out to to make a difference in. And what we do here is going to have eternal consequences and rewards. But we're called to be the church. Acts 7.38, they were called out and separated unto God. Now, when you look at your life tonight, can you say, I've really separated myself from the flesh? I've really separated my th myself from the things of this world? Or am I still kind of hanging out in there? The Bible says that if you're lukewarm, he'll do what? Yeah. Now, when I was running from God, the enemy used that scripture against me. I'm going to be real honest with you all tonight. Because I said, well, I can't be hot and I'm not really cold, and I'm lukewarm, he's going to spit me out anyway, so I might as well be all the way cold. Now that's not real smart. Don't try that because it'll get you in a place you don't want to be in. It'll take you straight to the pits of hell. But let me tell you, lukewarm will too. The only difference is you just think you're kind of half all right because you can feel a little bit of the water. And guess what you are? Whitewashed. Come on, I'm preaching real strong, but... The truth is the church is full of lukewarm, whitewashed people today. And it's and you're, and those people are not going to be the ones. The Bible says heaven belongs to the ones that, what do we talk about? Overcome. Overcome. You say, well, this is scaring me a little bit, preacher, the more you talk about this stuff here lately. Well, good. It's the fear of the Lord that will save you. It's the fear of the Lord that's the beginning of wisdom and understanding. <laughs> it's the fear of God that will wake you up and say, you know what? I can't just go through this however I want. God's required more from me. Now, but he didn't just require it and say you're on your own because you could never fulfill it on your own. He went ahead and gave his grace to empower you. He gave you the Holy Spirit to help you overcome. He gave you every tool you needed. You just had to submit to him as Lord of your life. And, and whenever the Holy Spirit talks to you, you have to, you have to willingly submit because he's a gentleman. He ain't going to come beating on you when you keep doing whatever you want to do. <coughs> Big smile, I know. <laughs> So God's called you out, and he's wanted to separate you. Only you can answer tonight when you look at your life and say, have I really separated myself from the things of this world? Because today, most, most people, it's so mixed up, people don't know the difference. They don't even know, it, you know, people should be able to sense something in your spirit, and they should be able to know you're a Christian without your fish bumper sticker and, your, and all your other stuff on your car and stuff. There should be such a difference in your life that it's known before you ever open your mouth. Now listen, there is seasons when the enemy comes and he tacks like a flood and all those things, you know. Uh, and we just have to, we have to keep things under wraps. Which pray for me as I'm going through this. So I've been having quite a bit of opposition, but God is greater uh, over the last few weeks. And, uh, and we'll go through those. But the key is, let me tell you, if you realize that you're having opposition, guess what that means I'm not doing? Not whitewashing nothing. I'm dealing with it. I'm applying the Word of God. I'm letting the grace of God empower me. Guess what? That's okay. But so many times we want to beat ourselves up when we're in that season of growth. But that's growth. That's healthy. Amen. Come on, are you with me tonight? Yeah. That's called being... How do you separate something? You realize that something's still there and you take it apart. Come on, are you with me? So the relationship of Jesus Christ and the church, already 20 after, I didn't even know the first page. The New Testament church was built by Jesus Christ. See, whose idea was the New Testament church that you're in tonight? Whose idea was it? Jesus. It wasn't some guy that <coughs> coached it up that thinks we should have this every couple of nights. It'll be a good thing. We'll just get together and talk about how good God is and how much He loves us. And we'll pat each other on the back until we get to heaven. And it'll just be a wonderful thing. And we'll just worship Him and it'll be good. You know, God did call you to worship. It isn't the first thing He called you to do. The first thing He called you to do is a go ye gospel. And going is the first thing he's, he's, He commanded you to do. And you can't ever go if you've never actually been sanctified and set, and set your life apart. Because they won't know the difference between you and what's going on around them. And I can tell you today, even most young people, millennials, most people in the world, they are really looking for something. That's why we have all this supernatural 
baloney all across even your TV and all across everything because everybody's looking for something. And they just want somebody to really just live it out in front of them. Did you know that? They're just looking for somebody to really live it. So upon this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Matthew 16, 18. We see two marvelous truths in this verse. First, Jesus Christ claimed the church as his very own. And second, the church would be victorious. Now, I'm going to get way ahead of myself here, but I'm going to drive this home tonight. I'm already out of time. But listen, God, the, it's not going to be those that survive that inherit the kingdom of God. He's not coming back for survivors. He's coming back for overcomers. And so many today are just trying to survive. We've, they've kicked into a survivor mentality. It's the teaching. It's even the songs we sing. And God's, not, God's coming back for a victorious church. We're going to see that in the Word. A victorious church are, are victors, not survivors. There's a big difference. A huge difference. Come on. And so, if you really want to be the church, you're going to have to get out of the victim mentality and say, well, you know, you say, well, preacher, you just said you were under attack. Yeah, I said I was under, but I said I was coming through. <coughs> I'm victorious through Christ Jesus. You won't convince me otherwise. But honestly, you have to answer yourself, do I have a victim or a victor mentality? Because God is only coming back for the victorious church. Amen. And a victim and a victor usually faces the same obstacles. But the outcome is always is already decided in your heart. <coughs> and it's easier just to whitewash it not deal with it. Moving on. For time's sake. For other foundation can no man lay than is laid, which is Christ Jesus, 1 Corinthians 3.11, and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ being the chief cornerstone, Ephesians 2.20. Jesus gave himself for the church. Feed the church of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood, Acts 20.28. As Christ loved the church and gave himself for it, Ephesians 5.25. Christ is the head of the church and hath put all things under his feet and gave, into, gave him to be the head over all things to the church, Ephesians 1.22. Which is the head, even Christ, Ephesians 4.15. Even as Christ is the head of the church, Ephesians 5.23. And he is the head of the body of the church, Colossians 1.18. The church and the body of Christ are synonymous. The church which is his body, Ephesians 1.22.23. So Christ is the head and we are the body. That means he tells us what to do and we should be responding accordingly to his actions. <coughs> Amen? And so then you have to ask yourself, who is really ruling in my life? The Bible says you can't serve two masters. And if you're really part of the ecclesia, if you're really part of the church, you've only got one ruler. And your life will be evident. Your life will be evident of it. Christ is the head of the church. Christ is inseparable from his body, the church. I am the vine, you are the branches. Listen, how many in here have ever heard that old thing? There was a big teaching on it years ago. How many have ever seen a grapevine? All right. If Jesus is the vine if, and we are the branches, guess what all you have to do is stay connected. But you know what happens sometimes? There's pruning and things that goes on to make those things look better and to produce more fruit. And so as long as you choose to stay connected and submitted to the vine dresser, you're connected to the vine and nothing can tear you away from it. But what if your fruit starts producing bad fruit? What if you start letting other things rule your life? Guess what's going to happen when the pruner comes around? The Bible says they'll be cut off and cut into the fire. So what do you think happens really to those whitewashed people? They're going to get pruned. They're going to get cut off. Things are going to get rough for them. Let's just be honest. I didn't write it. This is the truth. But God is asking the church to be the church. And you know what? 
These, these verses can either be very encouraging to you or they can be very challenging to you. The difference is the condition of your heart. The great thing is, as long as I stay connected to God, nothing can take me away from Him. Nothing can take me out. The bad news is, if I want to whitewash it and buy into all the other stuff, there's going to be someone come along and, 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 and you say, well, how do I know? Well, you guess what? Examine your own fruit. Is your fruit stinking? Is your flesh ruling you? Because if it is, you're going to get lopped off. That's the truth. You say, well, I, how do you know I'm, I'm doing this? Well, the Bible says if you're lukewarm, he's going to spare Well, I haven't done any big sins. Well, listen, his sin is sin. And you know if you're purposely going against the Word of God. Don't tell me you don't. Man, this is strong preaching tonight. Why? Because the Bible says God is coming back. For, I'm ahead of my notes tonight. But the Bible says God is coming back for a church without spot or wrinkle. You say, well, I can't be perfect. No, but you can allow God to perfect you. And I don't know about you, but I don't want, I don't want to get up there on Judgment Day and he say, depart, depart from me, you workers of iniquity. Because this is what we're talking about here. And they'll say, well, I prophesied in your name. I preached your name. See, he wasn't talking to people in the world that were total heathens, was he? Those people are already sealed. They know where they're going. He was talking to people that were playing church instead of being the church. So it's real enough that we need to talk about it now in a very real sense. Come on, are you with me? We the church are His body and His branches connected to the vine. We are members of His body, of His flesh, and of His bones. Ephesians 5.30 I mean, we're part of Him. That's an important thing. That's an awesome thing. Jesus Christ has ordained that, that, that there would be a body of believers to carry on the work He started while here on earth. You know what? Jesus designated this body. He even, to the point, he when He established this church, He said, I've got something for this church to do. And you know what? There are souls that are lined up in heaven, whether or not we win them or not, someday as the head over this church, I'm going to give account for. But guess what? I won't be the only one. There's things that God's required from each one of you that if you do not fulfill that, they'll be you'll say, well, I never even met that person. I've never even seen that person. And God said, well, it wasn't because I didn't intend to. They were waiting for you to give the gospel. They were waiting on you to save them and you were too busy doing this, this, and this. Or you were too busy over here not really being the church. Strong preaching, I know. Come on, are you with me tonight? I don't want to hear that when I get... I don't. I want to hear, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Mm -hmm. But I'm telling you, there's tens of thousands of souls that are, that, are, that are set aside for this body to reach that God has ordained. And it'll never happen unless we start being the church that He's called to be and start acting like His body. You say, are we not now? Well, I don't know. That's not for me to decide. I'm not going to get up in your Kool-Aid. I'm just preaching what the Word has to say tonight. So he has designed that this group of people share his vision of winning the lost, healing the sick, delivering the bound through the same Holy Spirit by what he did these things. Now, I, you all know I teach in depth on this around the world. But I want to tell you, if you don't have a hunger for the lost, if you don't have a hunger to see people heal, if you don't have a hunger, and I'm talking about, like, you, it's consuming you. I'm not talking about, oh, I think about it every once in a while, I'm really sad when so-and-so is not going to make heaven with me. He didn't just say your loved ones. He said the world around you. Come on, I'm preaching strong. If you do not have those things, then you really don't have the Father's heart. And you need to pray for your eyes to be enlightened and for his heart to start consuming you. Because <coughs> that is what he intends his body to be, first off. Amen? Amen? Through the same Holy Spirit which he did these things. So, you know, if he said, these works I've done, even greater works you're going to do. Who was he talking to? He was talking to the church. Jesus did marvelous things and he expects his church to do even greater things. That's what he's called us to do. <coughs> Not just to have a religious time together. Amen? Amen. That was my fault. That was a bad pastor. Turn it down. Amen. 
So verily, verily, I say unto you, <coughs> he that believeth on me, these works that I shall do, also and greater works than these shall he do, because I go to my Father, John 14, 12. We are to continue his work. How many know, somebody look at your neighbor and say, we've been, con we've been uh, commissioned <laughs> to continue Jesus' work. Now that's a strong thing, isn't it? But that is the truth of what the church is to be about. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost with power who went about doing good and healing some of those that were oppressed by the devil. All oh. oh, Acts 10.30. So you know what? When you see somebody being oppressed by the devil and they're coming up to you, you ought, something inside your spirit ought to rise up. And you ought to be ready to take authority over them and kick them to the curb. Now, listen, there is times that I've taught in depth on this that you've got to let me put enough word in them so they receive them so they're not just out there better about to pick up seven more because you got them, you sent that devil packet and they weren't ready to accept Christ. But you know what? You want to get me mad? And you know what? There is times for righteous indignation. And, and, and it, it does. I'm dealing with a few things now. But you have a demon come around and just keep on taunting around me, and I, I'm going to deal with that thing. You know, and so should you. We should not. We should have compassion upon people that are oppressed by devils, but we shouldn't have any compassion on the devils. Right. <clears throat> Amen. So then it goes on. We are anointed with that same Holy Spirit, but you shall receive power after the Holy Spirit has come upon you, Acts 1.8. Listen, that same power that Jesus went around doing these things, guess what you have as the church? You have it. Because as He is, so are you in this world, 1 John 4.17. We have the same spirit, same love, same vision, etc. Listen, everything that Jesus had for this world as a church, we should have. Now let me ask you, there's nothing wrong with wanting nice things. There's nothing wrong with God wanting to bless you. But do you really think Jesus was, was worried about getting the new Lexus and the new carpet and the new house? Or was he more concerned about his neighbor down the street that's going to split hell wide open? Or the little old widow down the street that didn't have any food and no one to help her? Or the person that was crying out and broken, just saying, well, you God, will you send somebody along to help me and speak to me and love on me? What do you think of which one's prayers he's going to really respond to? Which one do you think is going to activate the same anointing that was upon Jesus and he's anointed upon his church? Which church do you think God's wanting to see rise up? The ones that, I mean, listen, I've been in some rock and roll services. We've had them here where the Holy Spirit's poured it out. But even as I said then, all these years, God pours it out so we can take it out. Right. And he's been preparing this body's heart and maturing and growing people up so that he can do that more and more. I believe that with all my heart. Can I get an amen? Amen. And so, but it's, we should have his vision. We should have his heart. So many people have, have sought the presence of God, but they've not sought what to do with the presence of God. I'm telling you, if you'll start seeking what to do with it before you even get it, it'll, it'll, it'll be, it's already there. You don't even have to chase after it. If you seek His heart, He's going to enable you. He's going to supply it. He's going to fulfill every one of those promises. It says, signs and wonders shall follow them that believe. See, most people today, really, whether they, whether they want to admit it or not, they, they're seeking after a sign and wonder. They show up and, they, oh, I heard something's good going over there. Let's go see those signs and wonders. Oh, my face lighting. Let's go see what God's doing over here. That'll encourage me so much. And you know what? Somewhere there's somebody that's chasing God with all his heart believing and, making, and being Jesus with skin on and doing what the Word of God says, and these things are following them. And God's wanting those kind of people in every part of the world. He wants them in the marketplace. He wants them in the church. He wants them in the streets. He wants them in the byways. He wants them in the homeless shelters. He wants them at the bank. Amen? Amen. Amen. So this body of believers is the church. The church is the body of Christ. 
The habitation of God through the Spirit. I'm going to say that again. The habitation of God through the Spirit. So we are the ones that are should be where God dwells in. He once used to dwell in the temple. Now He wants to dwell inside us. If we never become called apart and sanctified, guess what? He's never going to be in a place that people are even going to recognize who He is. Amen? So, each believer born of the Spirit is an integral part of His church. You know, I know we've done all kinds of these kind of things throughout the years. It would be like if I came in here and I had one light. I'm in heaven, the presence, the presence of God, the fire of God is here. But what happens when the whole body gets together? Before long, man, there's a fire. It's a blaze. You can see, can't you? Do you know that that's how God expects us to flow? But what happens if just two or three are the ones carrying the flame? And everybody else is trying to get theirs lit once a week. I'll let you just go. I'll go with that. And moving on. So we being many are one body in Christ and every one members of one another. Romans 12, 5. So listen, it takes everybody for a church to function properly. <coughs> and there's one occupation that God never ordained. Y'all ready? He never ordained a pew sitter. There's no calling to be an ordained pew sitter. Sorry, I hate to break it to you. There's no calling where I'm just a Sunday go to meeting. That is not the church. That is lukewarm. I'm just going to tell you. Why are you telling me? Because someday I'll give an account. Now you can't say you didn't know. Hey, it's in there. I'm telling you straight. You'll say, well, pastor, that's what most people do. Well, then most people need to get a new relationship with God and do some fruit, fruit inspecting. And that's why most that's why our world's in the shape it's in, our country's in the shape it's in, because it's time for the church to be the church. Boy, this is strong me tonight. I'm glad I showed up. <laughs> now ye are the body of Christ and members members in particular, 1 Corinthians 12, 27. So if we're the body of Christ, let's think about it. We, uh, I know you guys, some of you have heard this for so many years, but think about this. If Jesus was standing here today, well, how would you expect his body to look? Would you expect the glory to be shining so bright you couldn't hardly stand? Come on, some of you are starting to click. Would you expect it to be so magnificent you couldn't hardly look at it? Do you realize that's what he's expecting from us upon the earth as his, as his body? Amen. Amen. So for the edifying of the body of Christ, how I many of that means for exhorting, for that means also for correcting. That means that we should be helping line each other out. Boy, isn't that popular today? You know, you were really grumpy the other day. You were really short with me. You were really just short, period. Do you need prayer? Do you need deliverance? <laughs> Is there something oppressing you? I've got the power. <laughs> Bless God. No, there's not. <laughs> Moving along. And that he is the head of the body, the church. So we see that Christ is the head. But how many know, listen, if Jesus was standing here, just think about it today. When you see the body, when you see the church, when you see the ecclesia all over the world, are we doing a very good job? Let's be honest. Listen, you say, well, Pastor, we've been at this a long time. The church has been around for a long time. Do you think just preaching this tonight? Yeah, I do think. I think the God of the last days is raising up a body of believers that are going to be a true representation of what his body represents. I believe that with all my heart. I believe it's called the end time harvest. Ooh, I feel the anointing. Yeah. And I believe he's calling out for people that's going to really be called out and set apart. But I believe that some people don't want to pay the price because all they're doing is counting the price instead of counting, instead of just saying, you know what, God, I'm all in. I trust you. Mm -hmm. yep. Moving along. Because we're for his body's sake, which is the church, Colossians 1.24. So, you know, you can say whatever you want. But if I if if, if I 
if you expected Jesus to show up here tonight and see Him in a physical form, you would expect His body to be a certain way. How much more so should we as the church be representing what we're supposed to be, what we we're wanting to be expecting ourselves? And that is really what the world is expecting to see in us. Boy, that's good right there. That would make a good book. Somebody ought to write that for me. Amen. Awesome revelations. The members of the church are in the family of God, and He calls them sons and children. So how many know that He calls us sons, children, daughters? We know that we are joint heirs with Christ. Amen? Amen. Isn't it good that if you're in the church, that makes you family? And if family, that gives you that gives you legal rights to inherit in certain inheritances. For as many as are do whatever they want, they are the sons of God. <laughs> what? What's that say? <laughs> what about if I really don't feel like doing that? What about if I really don't see it that way? Well, I didn't see it written exactly like that. I know that's what I'm feeling led by the Lord. I know that's what my pastor said. I know that's what the prophet said. I know they pointed to me in the Word of God. But you know. <laughs> Do you want to be a son? Do you want to be a daughter? Do you want to be the church? Do you want to be family? Because listen, I didn't write it, but I am here preaching and I'm giving it strong. If you are led by the Spirit of God, then you are a son of God. There is no. Uh, the, the, if you're not being led, if you're resistant to those things, then guess what? You're not. You're not a son or daughter of God. You'll say, "But I asked Him into my heart. I believe." Did you make Him Lord then? Because if He's Lord, you're going to be led by Him. Right. I know that goes against some doctrine that's been falsified for years. And, and listen, there is security believer. I've already preached on that during this basic Bible doctrine. There is awesome security believer. It's called being led by the Spirit of God, and you can be totally secure. You have a guarantee you will be a son and daughter of God. And nothing can take you out of that. And no devil can talk you out of it or deceive it. Well, I don't know if I'm led. Well, if you're questioning it, you probably got something going on you don't want to deal with. Now get up off your hind end and go deal with it. I know, strong tonight, ain't it? For the Spirit Himself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. Romans 8, 16. Ye have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father, Romans 8, 15. Listen, I was so happy when I read that verse years ago where I could cry, Abba, Father. Like, God really loved me enough that he counted me son. Because you know what? Usually as we start growing with God, I never felt worthy enough to be a son. I never felt good enough. And the enemy always tried to make beat on me and tell me, you aren't good enough to do that. You really think he loves you? And I learned as long as I listen to him, as long as I'm doing my best to hit the mark, I'm his son and nobody can take that from me. And I can cry, Abba, Father. I'm part of the family of God. I'm part of the church. I, even if I'm the crazy uncle nobody wants to meet, I'm still part of the church. <laughs> There, that we might receive the adoption of sons, and because you are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts. Thou art no more a servant, but a son. Galatians 4, 5 through 7. Beloved, now we are the sons of God. 1 John 3, 2. So see, as a member of the church, now you become more than just a member of the body. You become family. Isn't that good? Descriptions liken the church to a human body, 1 Corinthians 12, 12-27. Uh, the human body is one, yet is made up of millions of living cells. In like manner, the body of Christ is one, though composed of millions of born-again believers. As a human body is made alive by the soul, so is the body of Christ vitalized by the Holy Spirit. And if you're not led by the Spirit, you're not alive. You're, you become a dead, stinking part in that body. Amen? 
the purposes of the church. I've kind of touched on some of this already. Do you know that God didn't just, oh, we're saved, it's so good, I'm just going to worship Jesus. Those are part of the things that naturally come. Because when somebody truly saves you, you kind of like really like that person. You're like really appreciative. You like really want to worship them and they like set you free, you know. Especially if you were like me. I mean, you're like really thankful. You're like, man, <laughs> he loves me. And even still this day, I'm still amazed that he loves me, you know. I, I'm not perfect. I'm working on God. I'm much better. I, I, you know, I'm not saying I'm a heathen. I'm not saying I'm lukewarm, but I'm still growing in God. I'll be growing to the day I get home. But I also want to say this. I say all those things, but you know what? I've had some unfortunate things as pastor throughout the year. I say that, and then I get some knucklehead that comes up to me that's not even trying, that's doing whatever else under the, uh, under, under the sun, that's not even trying to live. And they'll say, well, preacher, you said you aren't perfect either, and you're doing these things. I said, yeah, but I'm not in open sin. I'm not in transgressions. I'm not in iniquity. Didn't you miss that part of the message? I said I'm not perfect. There's only one perfect one. You say, well, crucify. There's a reason why he says crucify your flesh daily. Because I'm in this world. And, Christ, and God's going to empower me to change. Would God need to empower me if I never had nothing to be empowered for? I mean, come on. Are y'all with me? So God's first purpose, somebody look at your neighbor and say, first purpose. first purpose. And his relationship to man was to seek and save that which was lost, Luke 19.10. I'm going to tell you, there's nothing more on the Father's heart than seeking and saving the lost. And as, as the church, if we're not after the lost, then there's something wrong with the church. It's not really the church, it's a community center. It's a social club. And we've heard all these things preached for years. Well, guess what? There's still nothing's changed in most places across the body of Christ. And the church has been commissioned to evangelize the world, to carry the gospel, good news to all the inhabitants of the earth. That means the church has the same power of Christ, and the enemy's got us so tied up that we're not using any of the power that God's, God's trying to flow through us. And the world is, is in a big vacuum looking for Christ to be Christ. And it's up to us to go and do it. I've, heard, I've had other people say to me when I've ministered someplace before, they've noticed the prophetic giftings on my life. And I've had several people say, oh, you have such an evangelistic gifting on you. And I, I look at them and I say, yeah, I do, but so do you. Everyone does. They're like, yeah, but when you call it, people come forward. I say, yeah, because I quit trying to fight it and just accepted that he said when I went, he would go with me. And that signs and wonders would follow me. And when I gave the call, people's hearts would respond because that's what the church is called to do, not just the pastor. And there's a whole world out there licking, waiting for Christ to show up. And he's only going to do that through you and me. So then we go on. Go ye therefore and, and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, Matthew 28, 19. I know I'm running out of time, but I want to touch here. I always bring this out when I'm teaching. I have it down here for my notes. But people get this verse and they want to run off to the nations. I want to go to Africa. I want to go to South America. Oh, Lord, send me and I want to evangelize. And he's trying to get them to stop down the road and buy a gallon of milk for a mom and her kids, and they won't even do that. They won't even help their co-worker. They just complain about how much they're on the nerves every day. I'll start looking at everybody I'm talking about them. I'm That's, you know, the first, nations means first your own backyard, then your own city, then your own state, then your own country. And then after you've proven yourself, he says, then he'll send you to the far reaches of the earth. It's amazing how everybody wants to go someplace extreme. I mean, let me just be honest, since I'm already on a roll tonight. 
Because that sounds glorious. That that feeds our flesh to want to go to some far nation. It doesn't feed our nation, our flesh to keep our, our flesh under wrap and get our character in such a place where people ever that know us in depthly, that know us personally, can be drawn to Christ around us. But until he we're able or faithful to do that, he can't send us anywhere else. But it always sounds so good to our flesh. Oh, that would be so uh, glory. You know, I would be just so awesome to be over there. I could just see it. You know, and they have all these grand delusions. You know. And let me tell you, if you don't have a right heart here in your own backyard in your own city, in your own nation, when you go over there and you face the obstacle, of what every demon in hell's done got an assignment to try to keep you from getting your assignment, you ain't gonna make it. Because you're gonna have to be able to look stuff in the eye and be real. You know, there's nothing more real when you ain't slept for two days and ain't, ain't hardly ate and you're ministering the gospel. And you know what? If you don't got your flesh under wraps, it'll come out every pore. And you won't be glorifying anybody but the flesh. Well, that's some strong preaching. And it starts when you start learning to uh, minister to those around you that know you on a personal level. Amen? Amen. And he said unto them, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to only the rich people. <laughs> to only the down and out. To only the ones you can see really need a hand. To only the ones you can really see having a bad day. Is that what it says? Every creature. That means you got to stop trying to figure out who needs Jesus. And believe it or not, that's the number one thing people do. <coughs> Everybody needs him. If you're talking to them, they're a prime candidate. Just remind, remember yourself that. Well, I just don't have anyone to witness to. Really? Have you walked down the street? Did you go to work today? Did you pick up the phone? Did you email? Did you even open your Facebook? I mean, it's a good thing if you didn't. But, you know, there's always somewhere somebody needs Jesus. You just got to quit trying to figure out who needs him. And you know what is, that's another one of those things that you go in a really great book because it's another one of the greatest things that people mess up because they're always, look, they're looking for somebody to needs a savior and they try to be one to him and they make it a, they make it a project. I'm going to get that one saved. Man, they're everywhere. Just go preach it to everybody. Quit trying to figure it out. Amen? Moving along. And you shall be witnesses both in, the, in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria to the uttermost parts of the world. Acts 20. That's the verse I quoted a while ago. That means start in your own backyard, in your city, in your state. And then after you've gone all that way, then he'll move you to the uttermost parts of the earth. But if you can't get it there, you'll never be ready enough to go. And if you're tired of going around that mountain, you're like, but I've been witnessing the same place for 30 years. Well, just keep being faithful in there, that place. That one you reach may reach millions. And it'll be worth it. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the worlds for a witness unto all nations, and then shall come the end. Then the end come, Matthew 24, 14. Listen, it's called, there's, there's people, there are still people that really have not heard the gospel yet. There was people in some really foreign places. I mean, when I, when I was in some places in Kenya, I was the first white guy they'd ever seen. They were going, Matonga, Matonga. I'd hiked up mountains for a day, you know, and through villages and things. And, and they were all, I, I, I was the thing to see. They were all lined up along the roads, you know. The only good thing was I knew when I started preaching, they was all going to come to see just what I had to say. I had a captive audience. <laughs> you know, just use it for its glory. <laughs> Amen. It was quite, a, quite an experience. <coughs> but if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost. 2 Corinthians 4.3 The church must be totally dedicated to carry out these commands. Listen, it's not an option, but everybody treats it as one. Everybody treats it, well, I'll do it sometime. Well, you know, I've been praying about Sister So-and-So that sits next to me. I, you know, I told that one person that one day. <laughs> Listen, church, that isn't what he's talking about. It's a command on a daily basis 
to share the gospel and to live in such a way that it causes people to come to Christ and not run away from it. You know, and there's been days when I've really thought, I was going to be honest, I hope, like I said, don't take this out of context, when I thought, God, are you sure you want to keep using me? Because I'm really having a really bad day, and I don't want to make you look bad. Now, don't be adding to that. I'm just trying to be, I've always been very real with you as, as a church, as a pastor, as a man. You know what I found? You know, there's a reason why that verse that said God's mercy is new every morning. Because I can come and say, listen, Daddy, <laughs> I'm doing my best, but I don't want to make you look bad <laughs> I need some help. And guess what he's faithful to do? He's faithful. Yeah. 1 John 1, 9 says he's faithful and just forgive us all our sins. Sins means we missed the mark. It didn't say it was a big sin. It didn't mean I was off doing some atrocious <coughs> thing. It said I realized that I was not being Christ for skin on. That is what sin is. It means I, re I realized I was not representing him in such a way that made him happy, that caused people to come to him. And when you start looking at your life in that light, You'll be, you might have some more days like Pastor where you realize, hey, listen, I'm sorry I missed it, Daddy. I, I need some help. Because when I see people, I want them to see Jesus. Now, listen, he's going to be Jesus in an old hillbilly's body. And he's, I'm like, he's always going to be my flavor in me. But I want him to see Jesus. That's my heart. And I hope that's your heart. But I'll challenge you that as you're challenged in that, you might have a few days where you're just like, man, Lord. <laughs> but it'll be so much good because he'll just keep fine-tuning you. But you'll never do it if you don't ever have a good look in the mirror. And if you never really learn who Jesus is, how do you know how you're supposed to be looking like? Amen? Amen. 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 <laughs> Move it along. His next person, and I find lots of people in the church like this next one anymore. But I found even more so that they want to worship him for what he's going to do for them, not what he's already done or not for who he already is. I hope you're hearing my heart, but I'm seeing this move across the body and, and waves. Everybody's worshiping him for what they want him to do for them, not worshiping him for what he's already done and who he already is. He's already everything we have need of. He's already, he's already done the whole thing. He's already worthy of praise if he never did one more thing. The most songs you hear are asking, Lord, I thank you for this. I'm having a, I'm, I'm a survivor, you know. Jesus, help me get through. And I know that isn't the lyrics, but you all know it's true. I mean, seriously, that's that's the society we're living in. And I like some of the songs, but you, what happens if that gets in your spirit after long enough? It'll change how you view things. It'll change what comes out of your heart. Amen? I think he just lost his tooth. The true worshiper shall worship the Spirit, Father in spirit and truth, for the Father seeketh such to worship Him. God is a spirit, and they that worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth. Now, if you're not being real with yourself, can you really worship God? You can offer lip service, but you really can't worship Him, can you? The whole mo man, it seems like I've just been on. Are y'all getting something out of this? I'm really not trying to beat on anybody. Is anybody even being encouraged? By you ought to be encouraged by some of this. I hope I'm not just. The whole multitude of disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works that they had seen. If these should hold their peace, the stones would immediately cry out. Luke 19, 37, and 40. You know, and when we come here on Sundays and eventually on Wednesdays again, we should come already with a grateful heart. He shouldn't, we shouldn't have to prime the pump. Amen. We should be ready to praise and worship our Savior for what He's done for us. It should be something we're doing on a daily basis. Amen. It's something He's commanded us to do. Worship Him. Yep. Love Him. Praise Him. It helps keep you connected to who He is. 
For he says, I will declare your, the Father's name, to my brother. In the midst of the worshiping congregation, I will sing hymns of praise unto you. Hebrews 2.12. And we also see where he's commanded us as a congregation to worship him. Because when we come together, the heavens start to open up as we worship together in spirit and in truth. Why? So he can come down and meet with us and we can go and be Jesus with skin on in the world. You know, if I ask most people what revival is today in a, in a charismatic movement, in a full gospel or Pentecostal movement, they'll talk about all the signs and wonders when the glory of God was so strong and people just kind of showed up to church and got saved. But you ask them where those people are at in 10 years, 5 years. Hardly no discipleship, no follow through. <coughs> most people have an emotional. They experience, it, don't they? they experience some of the glory on the outside, but very little of the God on the inside. And revival is when it changes the whole community it's in, when it changes the whole city it's in. Why? Because the church starts being the church. They start being Jesus with skin on. <coughs> Amen? God wants a worshiping church. He wants a church who will rise up and praise Him with a loud voice for all His mighty works. You know, God wants, I'm going to say it again, God wants a loud church. We just read it. He wants a worship. He wants one that a hoop, holler, shout, praise Him, and go ahead and make everybody, make, make their grandma shame because you're being so loud. You know? <coughs> he wants you to, to get more into, you know, listen, it may, I know you preach, people's been saying this for 30 years, 40 years maybe now, maybe 50, but it amazes me people can go to a ball game and scream to their horse. They go to a concert <laughs> and scream and shout till they ain't got nothing left. They come to the church and they're quiet as a mouse. They say, well, I just want to be dignified. I want to be respectful. And there's a season for that. There's a timing for that. There's also a time just to worship Him.